During the 1700s, there were two views about the nature of light. Huygens and his followers believed that light consisted of waves. And Huygens uh, explained reflection and refraction by his wave picture of light. The other view was that light consisted of particles, bullets shot out by the luminous body which affected our eyes. Newton had upheld the particle theory. In justice to him, it must be recognized that he did so very tentatively. He never expressed himself as quite sure, but on the whole, he thought, the particle theory was probably the right one. And Newton's followers uh, were far more convinced than Newton was himself. Now, towards the end of that century, a famous experiment was made by Thomas Young, Young's pinhole experiment, which proved that the wave theory was the right one, because he showed that light could interfere. This Young was a very remarkable man. He was a doctor, practicing doctor. He had other literary and scientific interests. It was he who found first the key to interpret the Egyptian hieroglyphics. He had done a great deal of work on cap capillarity or surface tension, on elasticity. Some of you may remember Young's modulus of elasticity. He was one of the first to uphold the three-color theory of color vision. And above all, what is so very famous, he did this pinhole experiment which could only be interpreted if light consisted of waves. Now, let me try with this diagram to show you what Young's principle of interference means. And let's take Young's original pinhole experiment. He made a pinhole on a, in a screen and illuminated it with sunlight, the brightest light he knew. And here, on his wave theory, we must suppose that these waves are coming from the pinhole here spreading out in this direction. In the path of these waves, he put two slits, two pinholes, rather, and the waves were allowed to come through those pinholes. So that in this space here, one had two sets of waves, one coming from that pinhole, one coming from that one. Here they are. And now, Perhaps you can see what interference means. Young argued that at a place like this, where the two sets of waves have crests and troughs that agree with each other, in step, as it were, the light will be bright. Where the crests and troughs just interleave each other like this, the crest of one destroys the trough of the other and there's nothing. Out here again, they agree and it's bright. So Young said, my fringes, my dark and light stripes, where the light overlaps, are caused by the interference of these waves, light, dark, light, dark, light, and so on. No light is ever lost. You gain here where they agree just as much as you lose here where they don't agree. But the light splits itself up into these two sets. And Young said this must mean that light's waves and not little bullets or particles. You couldn't get two sets of bullets interfering with each other and cutting each other out, but you can get it with waves. Here then is Young's picture of the effect which he drew when he wrote up a set of lectures which he'd given. The waves are coming in through these two pinholes here, A and B. They are spreading out in this direction, and you'll see all among these tracks there are places where the troughs and the crests alternate so that we get nothing, and places in between where they lie on top of each other where you get a strong effect. So you get these stripes of darkness and light spreading out from here, and when they fall on the screen, you get dark fringes at C, D, E, and F, and bright fringes in between. Now, Young explained his principle by his wave trough, by making a trough in which he could set up waves. And again I have here 
a picture from Young's book. Here is his source of illumination. Here is his tank filled with water, which has a glass bottom. Here is the dipper on a spring, which vibrated and made the waves. And the shadows of these waves were thrown by the light through the glass bottom onto this screen here. So he could set up waves and see how they behaved. We've got here Young's original wave trough, dating from the year 1800, when he was a professor in the Royal Institution. There is the trough, there's a bright light down below, at the back is a mirror, and in front there is a screen on which we can see the waves. Now, if you could just uh, dim down the light, I want to show you uh, Young's wave trough working. I think you can see the shadows of the two dippers, which are like Young's two pinholes. Now, we'll set those going, they'll send out waves, and I hope you can see spreading out the bright and draft fringes exactly as in Young's picture. Now, if I could have the lights on again, please. This is so important a principle, I'd like to illustrate it in another way, with sound this time. I've got here two speakers, and by making the connection here, I can make those both sound at a very high frequency. They're in parallel, so they are beating in unison, like the light coming through those two pinholes. Two sets of waves are coming out, they will cross over where Mr. Coates is over there. And I hope when he moves the microphone he's holding backwards and forwards, you can hear it passing through the uh, places where the sound is strong and where it is weak. The sound fringes, if we like to put it in that way. Now perhaps we might run through them rather more quickly. There, I hope you heard uh, these sound beats. Now I'll uh, try and uh, uh, demonstrate the same effect in a rather amusing way with a sensitive flame. I'll switch off the speakers for a moment and uh, show you how this flame works. Uh, I've got here a flame which is almost on the point of roaring. It's just not. And any sort of high note uh, makes it roar, as you may have noticed while I'm speaking. It just rattled the cash in my hand. Sister Susie sewing shirts for soldiers. You see how it dips every time at the high-pitched S noise. Well, we'll switch on the two speakers again. Uh, they will form a fringe field over in the neighborhood of that flame. And now, as Mr. Coates moves the flame backwards and forwards, uh, we will see the flame ducking up and down as it goes through the light and dark fringes, the points of high intensity and low intensity. Right. Uh, you will have seen how the flame ducked down and went high again uh, as Mr. Coates moved it through the fringes caused from, due to interference from these two sources. Well now, I want to show you Young's famous experiment of getting attraction fringes with light and so establishing the wave theory of light. We're going to use slits instead of pinholes. It's fair to do so because if you look at my diagram here, you realize that if there's a slit here and two parallel slits here, you can regard this as a series of pinholes and they all form their fringes on top of each other so you get them in the same position and reinforcing each other. We're using slits instead of pinholes because 
you get so much more light. When one realizes how difficult it is to set up this young experiment, one can't but admire Young for having done it originally. Uh, instead of a, the sun, as Young used, we're using an arc lamp there, uh, which the coach is now turning that on, and in front of that arc lamp is an extremely fine slit. Here, about eight feet away, we've got two slits, again very close together, about a millimetre apart. And there's a shutter in front of one of them, I can open it by turning this knob here, bearing both slits, or close it, leaving only one slit open. We'll see the fringes over in the distance on my right. We have to use slits very close together indeed, and look at the fringes at a distance, because you must remember how short the wavelength of light is. There are about 40 to 50,000 light waves in an inch. Again, we admire Young having got the effect with a very crude apparatus at his disposal. So now, if I go over here uh, with this piece of ground glass, I'll place myself so that the fringes fall on my ground glass, and with the slits as close as this, in spite of the short wavelength of light, the fringes will be far enough to see with the naked eye. Well, now I've placed myself in the line of the optical beach. So if I could have the lights down now, please. When I hold up my ground glass, what I see here uh, is the image cast by a single slit. It's a white patch of light, and on either side of it, there are uh, colored fringes, what are called diffraction fringes. These have nothing whatever to do with Young's effect. It's a rather more complex effect that you get when light passes through a narrow slit. But now, if I ask Mr. Coates to uncover the second slit, its patch of light falls on top of the first one, and I can see that the patch is covered with beautifully regular, fine, black and white fringes. These are the actual Young's fringes, which he observed and so proved the wave theory of light. Now, why were scientists so reluctant to believe in the wave theory of light? It is because of the sharpness of shadows. They could not understand how light, if it was waves, could cast such very sharp shadows. We don't often see these sharp shadows, because most sources of light to which we are accustomed are rather broad, so that the shadows are fuzzy. But if we have a really fine source of light, like I've got here, and now, if Mr. Coates positions it to cast its light on this screen, and I switch it on, and now, if Mr. Coates holds up his arm in front of the screen, I want you to see how sharp those details are, although his arm is quite a long way away from the screen. That is the effect which puzzled them so much. Could I have the lights up now, please? Now, they couldn't believe that waves could cast shadows like that. Young himself couldn't understand it, although he believed in the wave theory of light. It was left later for the great Fresnel to explain how it happened. The answer is that the shadows are so sharp with light because the wavelength of light is so extremely short compared with the size of the objects that are casting the shadow. If we have very short waves, compared with the size of the obstacle, then you get a sharp shadow behind that obstacle. If, on the other hand, the waves are long compared with the size of the obstacle, for instance, sound waves, which go round corners quite easily, then the waves bend right into the shadow, and in fact, the obstacle hardly makes any difference. The waves seem to heal themselves as they go past it. Well, now, I'll, I'll turn down the lights again, and we'll just show that with our wa Young's wave trough. In the first place, Mr. Coates has got a dipper, the one like those we used before, which gives very short waves. 
he's placed in front of that an obstacle which is of a fair size compared to the wavelength and I think you will see that behind that obstacle there's quite a sharp shadow. Right, shall we start it going now? There, do you see the shadow behind the obstacle uh, with these short waves? Now, Mr. Coates is going to replace this stiffer that makes the short waves with a very slow vibrator, which makes quite long waves. The same obstacle will be placed in the path, but I hope you'll see that the waves reheal themselves and go on much as before. There, now we'll set that differ going. There are the long waves in the trough, and you see the obstacle really is making practically no difference at all to them. Right, could I have the lights up now? Uh, on the other hand, uh, light does bend round obstacles to a small extent. I'll show that again with the same setup with which we showed the fringes. The young fringes, like as in his pinhole experiment. We've got again uh, a lantern over there on my left with an extremely fine slit in front of it. Uh, this time we'll take away the double slit that we've got here and replace it first of all by a little shutter which I've got here which has an extremely sharp fine edge on one side and what I want you to observe is that the light does to a certain extent bend round this edge and we'll then replace that edge by this little window here in which we placed an ordinary sewing needle and you'll see the rather pretty pattern made by the light which bends round the sewing needle. Well now I'll go to my position for uh, viewing these effects with my ground glass screen and I hope to show you that light really does bend round corners. Well, I'll position myself again now so as to see these diffraction effects. And uh, Mr. Coates uh, uh, turns the arc on and we turn the lights down. Uh, we'll replace the, the two slits that I had before by a window with a very sharp edge. Now, what I want you to notice is that on either side, really, the edge there are effects which show the light is bending right into the shadow. Uh, you notice that just outside the edge, the light is brighter than it would be normally. Then again, outside, there's a dark line, and then it fades away into the general illumination. Well, those effects are due to light which has come around the edge. It's an interference effect rather too complicated to explain, uh, Fresnel first explained it, but it shows certainly the lights going around the edge. Now Mr. Coates will replace that window by one in which we've placed a needle. And here the diffraction effects are quite complicated. You will only see the bright line outside the shadow, but I think some other fringes, and a curious fringe right in the middle of the shadow of the needle. Obviously, the light is not going dead straight. The waves are bending round the corners. Now if I have the lights up, please. Uh, here's a very simple experiment you can try for yourselves. Uh, look at a distant street lamp through a window and move your head so that the street lamp just disappears behind the edge of the window. Now, if you look, you will see that the edge has a bright white line along it. And you can see that even if you move your head quite a long way into the geometrical shadow, as it's called. This, of course, again, is due to light which light waves which have bent around the edge. Well, it was interference fringes like this, which led Young to assert that light must consist of waves. He was quite right, it started a new chapter in the history of optics. And the Royal Institution is proud that in the year 1800, Thomas Young was one of the professors here and gave lectures in our theatre about these effects.